United States today announced a project to launch space satellites, satellites that will circle the Earth in the outer atmosphere. By 1953, Pittsburgh had a 15-minute news broadcast at 11 p.m., the world news tonight. In contrast to earlier newscasts, this news was produced independently by WDTV, not advertisers who had purchased the airtime. Newspapers and wire machines provided most of the content. News was provided as a public service, and local companies sponsored the broadcast for prestige rather than profit. And there was a bad auto accident on the Penn Lincoln Parkway East this afternoon. It happened near Edgewood. It was all trial and error. Mostly, we read the news in the studio or conducted interviews like this one with Ohio Senator Robert Taft. There were only two of us in the newsroom, news editor George Thomas and myself. I was the news director and reporter and anchorman and occasionally the film editor too. What we needed was a full-time shooter. Dumont gave us a mere $60 a week. If we had our freelancer shoot a big story on Tuesday and the whole city blew up on Thursday, then we'd have to tell you about it from the studio because we were all out of film and money. The WDTV newsroom would soon get that shooter as pit parade cameraman Chucky e. Boyle proved its worth. A young man had climbed the Smithfield Street Bridge intending to jump off. And up there with them, 100 feet above the Monongahela was cameraman Charlie Boyle who was shooting for Pit Parade, the evening magazine of the 50s. Talk about eyewitness news. The man advanced on Charlie, and Boyle conked him with his camera, staggering the man long enough for the police and the firemen to rescue him. That film led the 11 o'clock news and landed Chucky e. Boyle a full-time job as WDTV's first TV news cameraman. Now TV newsmen could go to the scene. Police scanners and two-way radios were the guide, Black and white film and cumbersome audio recording equipment were used for the record. As more Pittsburghers purchased television sets, sponsors started noticing a return on the newscast visibility. Advertising on live TV was an emerging force right along with TV news. As with any experiment, the results were often unpredictable. Now, it comes time to clean it, and boy, you know what a problem that used to be. See this little strip? I just pinch it. Pull it right out. And watch this dandy thing. Boy, for a guy like me, this really hits home. Okay, you just reach in like this, I think. <laughs> well, I guess they should have pulled out the other side, too. I told you I was no handyman, but I wanted to do this live because in doing so, I'm going to show you that we have something here that I think is great. This reminds me of some of those TV classic bloop commercials. <laughs> okay. Yeah, one great rehearsal. <laughs> Quit laughing, you guys. I'm having a tough enough time. <laughs> this is too much. Oh, man. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> See how he... <laughs> See how... <laughs> That's too much. <laughs> oh, man, Dad, you've done it again. In 1955, Westinghouse Electric purchased WDTV for $9,750,000. Westinghouse gave Pittsburgh's only TV station a new name, number, and home in the brand new Gateway Center. Not long afterward, the KDK monopoly would end and TV competition would begin with the addition of WIIC-TV in 1957 and WTAE-TV in 1958. The audience continued to increase as this new medium seemed to be especially suited for the tumultuous times of the 60s. Immediately, on on the air in what we call our announce booth. I felt so lovely yesterday, but I'll take it <laughs> off now if you want me to. I just don't know how much weight I lost. They can really see in this. Here is a bulletin from the KDKA television newsroom, Dallas, Texas. Shots have been fired at the presidential motorcade. After that bulletin, we couldn't just return to the Mike Douglas show. A camera was quickly wheeled into the newsroom. In my shirt sleeves, I reported every scrap of information that came over the teletype. I remained on the air for more than two hours. More than any single event, the assassination of President Kennedy set the standard for television news. Viewers came to expect that television would bring them pictures of the day's events. Not yet instantly. That would come later, but very, very quickly. A multiple alarm fire broke out in Hazelwood about 2.30 this afternoon. 
As the public's appetite for news grew, the stations willingly met the demand. Newscasts were added and expanded from 10 minutes to 30. The sales department and newsroom were clearly defined and separated, as were the newscasters and the commercials. Adam Lynch anchored the news for WIIC in the 60s. I think all of us who were in it believed that the, that the most important element of what we did was all the things that we'd been taught that were important, honesty and integrity and decency. <laughs> Remember decency? Uh, accuracy, uh, a good journalistic effort, uh, writing well, producing well. Those were the things that counted. Measurement of the size and demographic breakdown of the audience also started to count. These ratings affected the rates that stations could charge their advertisers. A lot of money was at stake because Pittsburgh was the ninth television market in the nation and the third largest corporate headquarters. Local news was no longer a public service. It had become an important generator of revenue and profit. The stations were forced to measure their audiences by using outside rating services. Consultants were brought in to conduct polling and focus groups to help package the product. With me here on the field is Danny Murtaugh, the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Danny, what do you think of the brand new house? Well, if I could use one word to describe it, Bill, I'd, I'd have to say it's awesome. It sure is, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful to see. By the 70s, the bond between TV news and the public had been cemented. Live news coverage was now possible through satellite trucks and videotape. Sadly, though, the rush to use the new technology resulted in tragedy. Untrained crews were sent into the field to learn how to use the bulkier videotape equipment. Unaccustomed to blind spots, veteran cameraman Ed Romano was crushed to death by a tractor trailer while covering a strike. News continued to grow. What started out as a staff of two was now 75. Reporters and equipment traveled to cover political campaigns and events of local interest. Good evening, Bill Burns speaking to you again from Madison Square Garden and the Democratic National Convention in New York. In its governmental regulatory role, the Federal Communications Commission wanted to be sure the public was well served. The limit of five TV stations per owner was strictly enforced. For license renewal, minority employment quotas were established and public access programming was mandated. Jane Adair was head of programming for KDKA-TV. During those times, there were three or four stations in a market that would compete for all of the money and everybody had a nice, safe share of the pie. And companies that ran stations uh, could afford to do public service. And some companies even went above and beyond what they were supposed to do and did more public service. Competition became fierce during the sweeps. These were four rather short rating periods each year in which advertising rates were set. Newsrooms prepared special news series and promotions as enticements to attract viewers. In the middle 70s, maybe a little later than that, where it appeared to me as though management was uh, obsessed with the competitive position more so than the size of the product, the quality of the product. For a long time, the quality of the product was just as important. And then it seemed to me that gradually it began to shift and the competitive level and the rating obsession became more and more important. Oh my God, we slipped five points. Oh my God, we slipped 10 points. Did we write well? Did we produce well? Did we cover well? Did we do enterprising, good journalism? Yeah, 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 but the bottom line, it seemed to me at some point, the sales manager became perhaps even more important than the news director. The 30-year-old party of robust growth in TV news ended in the 80s. There was not one event that changed the climate of local news, but several. They all related to economics. Pittsburgh's industrial base was crumbling and its population was aging. We plummeted from the ninth television market to the 12th to the 17th in a decade. Competition escalated with the growth of cable TV, satellites, and the VCR. During the mid-80s, as cable started to develop and these channels started to 
proliferate and viewers had many more choices and particularly in cities like Pittsburgh there was less money to go around anyway it began to be very difficult to spend money on local programming that had been spent before and if you had to make a choice as to what you were going to do as a general manager, you simply had to make the decision to do local news. And programs like, in, in the case of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Today, Pittsburgh's Talking, um, Evening Magazine, those programs went away, and they have not come back. Syndicated talk shows and tabloid programs took their place. To get ratings, the industry found itself in a race to debase. The higher standards of the established networks and local broadcasters were compromised in order to compete for viewers. More local news was also added. It was relatively less expensive to produce. It was also relatively profitable because the local stations could retain all the advertising dollars from local news commercials. Another important development in the Reagan era of the 80s was government deregulation that brought profound change to the communications industry. More stations could be owned by single owners, and restrictions on resale were loosened. The result was that networks and local stations came to be treated as other commercial assets by the corporate world. More than ever before, owners and managers were looking for profits rather than prestige. Public service and journalism gave way to return on investment. Carolyn Ween was the news director and general manager for Westinghouse Broadcasting in the 80s. Seven to ten years ago, I felt the pressure is growing. One, because of competition, and two, I think another, another issue that's affected television news is that there are far fewer media companies. And a lot of great programming and news programming came out of the small groups where there were broadcasters who, and it was easier to make money in the early 80s and the 70s than it is today, made their money and made good money, but they also had a commitment and some of them even lived in the communities or worked in the communities where they had stations. The pressure for ratings drove station managers to seek outside help for the news department. Consultants advised managers on targeting particular types of news to appeal to the highly coveted 18 to 49 year old female demographic segment. News was now driven primarily by the quest for ratings in order to maximize the ad revenue dollar. Joe Rovito was the news director for WTAE in the 80s and regularly dealt with consultants. Yeah, you do resign it. You hate that. Who wants to hear that you know you really worked hard but it's not good enough? <laughs> <laughs> of course you resent it. But at the same time, smart people know that uh, you don't know it all, and you don't know all the answers, and you do have to have somebody come in sometimes and look at it. Um, the problem comes in is when a television station or any organization, I don't care if it's a, if it's a steel mill or a, a cookie factory, it doesn't matter, if you allow your consultants to make your decisions for you, that's a mistake. Consultants are paid to advise. You are paid to decide if you run a television station. Don't you think consultants are crossing the line when it comes to news content? It depends on the cons it, it, honest, Honestly, it depends on the consultant, and it depends on the station. It's a collaboration between the two. And I think, um, in some cases, the answer to your question is absolutely. <laughs> In 1993, meters arrived in Pittsburgh to electronically record where TV sets were tuned. This little black box accelerated and reinforced the pressure on TV news that these other events had started. When there were three stations and, and you recorded your viewing with a diary system, if you couldn't quite remember what you watched the day before, you just remembered what TV station you normally watched and you wrote that down. Now with the meters, the meters record specifically what that sample of homes is tuned to. And what that has meant is that independent stations have had a lot better economic base than they did before. They show greater viewership, and now they have a bigger slice of the pie because advertisers see that people in Pittsburgh are really watching the stations they used to be called independents. In fact, now they're mostly affiliated with other networks like Fox, like the WB. But the big three, ABC, CBS, and NBC, the big three viewership has all been eroded. Barbara Van Cherry covered TV news for the Post-Gazette when meters arrived. That triggered a whole host of changes in terms of the pacing of the newscast, the teases, the stunts, the giveaways. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also just been a greater amount of competition than ever before. You have all of these cable channels. You have all of these networks. You have computers vying for someone's time now. So 
uh, trying to get that viewer to sit there and not hit that remote control has become more vital than ever. There was even some talk at the very beginning when the meters came in that stories seemed to be kind of chosen based on neighborhoods that seemed to have a lot of meters. So, I, you know, you could never confirm that, but it always did seem somewhat suspicious. You take a market like Pittsburgh where you essentially have a three-way race, it is very, very competitive. Is it an incubator for excess? Yeah. But at the same time, it is also an incubator, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, uh, to give the viewer your absolute best, to do the best job that you can possibly do in covering local news. I see it as a real positive, not the negative that, that many of our uh, ink stain brethren from the uh, media, uh, print media might suggest. Now, Pittsburgh has a fourth source for local news, WPGH Fox. Competition for viewers has never been more intense. This is apparent in the structure and content of local TV news. Stations routinely poll their desired audience on what they want to watch. They then willingly oblige, and in the process, have essentially surrendered journalistic judgment. We're essentially going to the viewer and saying, what do you want us to tell you about? In that regard, I would submit to you that it is very democratic. We're saying to you, what do you want? How can we serve you best? Now, if you don't like, or if other people don't like, what the viewers say they want, I submit to you, your problem is with the viewer, not with me. Now, that may sound very crass, but we are in a business. We are in a business. Our viewers are our customers. If you get into a particularly competitive situation, I think sometimes it can be bad because sometimes you'll manufacture stories to suit what you think the viewer wants to see. And um, I think that that has been creeping into TV news a lot within the last two or three years. The law was in every newsroom, find more than one source, check the authenticity of it, and don't run with the story until you know it's valid. Don't run with a quote until you know it has some substance. Today, find the quote now, run with it, and ap apologize later. That's tawdry. Now, is it corruption? I won't go that far, but it is dangerous. I think it is dangerous when you start playing that kind of frenzied promotional, frenzied competitive journalism. Competition in many ways has driven news to a higher level. The bad news is <laughs> that it has become so economically dependent that even though many people don't want to admit it, the financial pressure does, at least indirectly, I think, impact decision-making that's not purely journalistic. I don't think people do it out of sense of venalness, but they're in a, they're in a tough business and they're fight, you know, scrapping for ratings and for what follows, which is money and profits, and they're harder to come by. From 1949 to today, TV news has evolved into a billion-dollar industry. And today, TV news has more technology, capabilities, and capacity than those early pioneers could have ever imagined. But is it better? The quality of the work that's being done now is, for the most part, much better because we have improved um, not only in what we do back in the newsroom, but we've improved in, in our ability to generate our own news stories. The problem for television news is that age-old problem of appearance versus reality. And television is a medium where the more simple the story is and the faster the story is, in many cases, the more easily understood it is and the easier it is to promote. So when you are concerned primarily with your viewership, you tend to create and promote the type of story that very quickly gets an audience to tune in. There's some good reporters here on all, all three or four stations um, and some fine work being do done. It's just not as, um, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't challenge me to watch. I would say that it has been diluted. I would say that it has been infected. Uh, it, it has been uh, compromised by blatant profit-making 
determinations, profit-making decisions. We are businesses, and I don't apologize for that. I think television news in, in any competitive situation can be a convenient whipping boy. Um, the fact of the matter is, I think the quality of local television news is probably at its highest, no matter the criticism. Are there excesses? Absolutely. Does competition produce excess at times? Absolutely. Um, does um, uh, money produce uh, uh, an interest in money in one way or another produce those kinds of problems? Absolutely. And this is jobs of people like me and the news directors and the like to balance all that.